Okay, so today we're going to be talking about composing front-end web applications with Montage.js. So I'm Ryan Paul. Uh, I work for Montage Studio in developer relations, and uh, I'm a front-end app developer. So back in the day, like 1801, there is an inventor named Eli Whitney. He's best known for creating the cotton gin, but he was also a gun manufacturer. And he's one of the pioneers of interchangeable parts. He had a contract to produce rifles for Congress. And they were investing heavily in you know, advanced production mechanisms that would allow them to get more output. So at one point, they had him give a presentation for, uh, for, for the military and Congress um, to show what he'd been working on. And what he did was he took a bunch of rifles that he had manufactured. He disassembled them on the spot. And he put all the like parts together. So you have you know, all of this component in one basket, all of that component in another basket. And then he proceeded to assemble rifles from the disassembled parts, essentially mixing the components from previous rifles to build new ones. And it was unprecedented. I mean, people had had this idea that you could do that, but nobody had actually done it at manufacturing scale before. Um, and it was considered one of the milestones that, that brought the Industrial Revolution to the United States. Uh, when you have interchangeable parts, you can simplify manufacturing, increase repairability, and generally reduce all of your costs. So in the 60s, uh, there was another pioneer, a software pioneer, uh, Doug McElroy, and he gave a presentation for um, the uh, NATO Science Committee. And he had a new take on this old idea of, of uh, you know, industrial manufacturing. He wanted mass-produced software components that would allow developers to take an assembly line approach to software development, effectively building applications by piecing together existing parts. So here we have Mr. Pugsley at the assembly line to illustrate that point. Um, but you know, this is a really compelling idea. Doug McIlroy, he went on to invent Unix piping which is, I think, one of the most you know, elegant expressions of this idea of, of assembly line programming. Um, you know, but we've learned a lot since Doug McElroy. We, you know, we have all of these new ideas from object-oriented programming about you know, encapsulation and you know, how to maximize code reuse. Okay, so you know, what we, what we want to be able to do is truly assemble our entire front-end web applications from individual units of prefabricated functionality. Uh, we want to be able to simplify development and reuse more of our code. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how you can do that. So Montage.js is a front-end web development framework. Uh, it's designed for building single page applications and it works in modern browsers. Uh, it's an open source framework we distribute under the BSD license. So one of the, uh, the central tenets of Montage.js is that everything is a component. Um, our component architecture is somewhat unique, and uh, it'll, it allows for this kind of composability that, you, you really, you know, that we've really aspired to previously. So uh, in a Montage.js project, you have all of your components, and they're stored in a, a folder, which you know, by convention, we give that dot .real extension. Uh, and a component, you know, there's no magic. It's made up of standards-based HTML, JavaScript, CSS. Um, it is just web content. Um, but it does have one thing that's unique, and that's a JSON component declaration. Um, that JSON declaration is where we describe the contents of the component and the way that, those, that the, the, uh, the pieces inside connect to each other. We define our bindings and that sort of thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, you know, that now. We have. Um, you know, the HTML content is just HTML. You know, you have an HTML file, then it is, you know, you can open it in a browser, you can view it as HTML. You can actually take the individual content from a single component and view it and edit it. This is really important because it, it facilitates better cooperation between developers and designers. Your, your designer doesn't have to understand anything about the framework in order to be able to work with the underlying HTML content. Um, so the JSON, the component declaration, it's, it's basically like a declarative description of what's inside of the component. And, and to get more technical with you, it's like, it's like a JSON uh, format object serialization. 
So if your component is an object and it has a bunch of other objects inside it, what, we've done, what you've done is essentially serialize it into JSON. And that's what the component declaration is. It's like a, a representation of the internals. I'll show you the code in a second. You'll see an example of a component declaration. I'll make it a little more clear. Uh, when we load that component declaration in the application, what we do is instantiate all of the objects inside of it. And then we attach the ones that are, that are connected to the DOM to the page. Um, and then we populate component properties and establish the bindings. Okay, so here's, here's what component declaration looks like, that JSON that you see at the top. Um, and then at the bottom, what you see is the HTML that corresponds with it. This is from a simple application that does temperature conversion. You have uh, a Celsius number field and a Fahrenheit number field. And when you put a value in one, you'll get the equivalent value in the other field. And there's no JavaScript code at all behind this. It, it's done entirely with data bindings um, and the component declaration. So the component declaration, we have several elements here. Um, you can see that prototype field that I've highlighted. Uh, that basically is a reference to the module that we're using to instantiate the object. So each of those top level blocks there, like the Celsius number field block, the Fahrenheit number field block, those are objects. And the prototype is the component that we're going to instantiate when we're creating those objects. And in this case, it, you, know, you can see the dot real extension. You can see that it is a component, but it could also be an object. You know, we're using uh, common JS module loading, so um, you, can, you can load conventional objects in there too. Um, so next, we want to be able to take those, those objects from the component declaration and attach it to the document object model. And uh, to do that, we have this element property. Uh, which I've highlighted here. And so the element property in the component declaration correlates with a data montage ID attribute in the associated HTML tag. So if you look at the bottom and you see that we have those, those two input fields with data montage ID tags for Celsius and Fahrenheit, those get attached to those uh, number field components that we've instantiated in the object. Um, this is really significant here. Like one of the, one of the things we care a lot about is, is not cluttering up our markup. Uh, we don't want any, any logic, any application logic in our HTML code. We care a lot about separation of concerns. And you know, part of how we achieve that is by putting all of the, the, uh, you know, the, the glue that holds the application logic together in the component declaration. And the only thing we have to put in our markup are those data IDs that associate the, the components with the HTML. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about data binding. We have uh, a fairly sophisticated binding system, our functional reactive bindings, uh, abbreviated FRB. It's created by uh, my, my friend and coworker, Chris Kowal. Uh, some of you may know for his work on the Q library. Uh, he tells me that I'm not allowed to pronounce FRB as Furby. So of course I have to. Um, what, what uh, FRB does is it, it propagates changes between object properties. So when you're creating your application, you're doing your data binding, you're connecting a property of one object to a property of another so that when, when one changes, that change propagates to the other. And that can be done in one direction or two directions. Um, FRB is an open source library that you can use standalone. We've integrated it very tightly into Montage.js, but you can also use it by itself. Uh, and it, it can work with components or regular old JavaScript objects. So when you're doing your bindings, you can bind to, you can just take some JavaScript object that you've pulled from some REST you know, API, you know, some JSON you pulled from a REST API, and you can just bind right into it. Um, you can also use it to connect properties of components, as I'm going to show you next. So uh, in our component declaration, when we have a, like a binding section for each object, and when we use that, that two double arrow, that, that signifies a two-way binding. So what we've done here is we've taken the Fahrenheit number field and we've bound it to the Celsius number field. And if you look at the binding expression, you can see we're doing a little bit of basic math in there to do the conversion between the two temperature formats. Um, one of the cool things about FRB is that you can, it, it's a very rich expressive language. You can, you can do a lot of computations and data manipulation in the bindings themselves, which spares you from having to, to do it in code. So, you know, instead of having to take your data structures and tear them apart and wrap them with a bunch of things and then create computed properties or whatever, you can really get a lot done just with bindings by themselves. So the end result of what you would see here is that 
uh, if, if the number field changes, it's just going to compute the, the equivalent value for the other number field. Uh, as I'll show you later, it, you can do some interesting things with, with uh, collections and data structures too, uh, with FRB expressions. So, you know, as I said, clean semantic markup is, is a huge emphasis for us. And I, I really like to, to bring up this point because it's one of the things that attracted me to this framework initially. We don't have any procedural flow control statements in your markup. You know, you've probably seen some, some other, you know, JavaScript MVC frameworks where you have like a for each or something or, you know. We, we don't do that. We want to keep the markup as pure and unadulterated as possible. So what you're looking at in this example here is the markup for uh, like a, a list. And instead of a for loop, basically, what we have here is just a div tag with a data montage ID that says list places. And in your application, you would have a component in your component declaration, uh, it's called a repetition. You'd use a repetition component, which will repeat all of the elements nested inside the attached div, or the attached element. It can be any HTML element. So, you know, by, by taking that approach, we, we've made it so that you don't have to clutter up your, your HTML or, or combine logic and presentation. Um, so, unlike me, it's completely clean-shaven framework, no mustaches. All right, and so there's Pugsley again helping us keep the markup clean. All right, so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit here, show you an application that I've made with Montage.js, give you a little bit of a, a sense of what you can do with the component system. Uh, this application uh, is designed to help groups of people decide where to eat together, which I'm sure you know is one of the hardest problems in engineering. Um, if you've ever tried to do lunch with your team or whatever. Uh, so the application is called Nominate. And basically, people suggest places and then vote on them. Uh, it's a full stack JavaScript application. The back end is written, the API back end is written in Sales.js. And the front end is written with Montage.js. Um, and it uses WebSockets for real time voting. So here we go. I hope everybody can see that. Yeah. OK, so in Nominate, you create a poll, and then you add a place. And what we're using here is uh, browser geolocation and the Google Places API to allow you to do a place search. I don't know if my connectivity is good enough. OK, so in anticipation of connectivity issues, I had a tab open with the example here. But yeah, so it'll, it'll pull in locations around you. And it'll let you add them to the poll by clicking one of the, pl the plus button in one of those places. You can see that tile, each tile has the name of a place and then an address, right? So when, your vote, when the users are voting, you see the, the polls. Uh, it's, again, the same tiles, the, the name and then the address. Then underneath is a vote button. And when you click the vote button, it'll add your vote. And then it's probably hard to see, not enough contrast on the projector, but it's tallying the vote. Um, and you can switch your vote if you're logged in. So very simple application. One of the things I'm doing here, these tiles are a component. Uh, we have a, a mechanism for template replacement. So you can take a component and you can specify a part of it that can be extended in place. So in the context in which you use the component, uh, you, you get to add elements to it. So we have the same tile, but in one case we have a vote button, and in another case we have the plus button. And you can actually do that in the component in which you're consuming the, uh, the tile. Um, so that's, that's one way in which components help us increase the amount of code reuse that, uh, that we get. We can, we can reuse those elements and, and not have to do the same work over and over again. Um, we can make them generic and allow us to tailor them to the, to the context. So another feature here, let's see if I can open an incognito window so you can see when it's not logged in. Let's see if that loads. Yeah, I might be having connectivity issues, but OK. So we have a login form and a sign up form. And you can see the login and the sign up form are very similar. Um, it, it's basically just your username field and then your password field. And the main difference is whether you have two password fields to check the password during registration. And then 
the, uh, the label on the button, whether it's sign up or log in. So in this case, we're using one component for both contexts, but we're using data binding within the component to customize it for the scenario. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the URL bar here, you'll see we have a, you know, hash identity slash sign up. And we have a very simple like route controller here. And the component, the login component, is bound to the route controller. And it looks to see whether you're on the sign up route or the login route. And depending on which one you're using, it'll show you the correct form. And that's all done, again, with FRB expressions uh, inside of the code. So we don't need JavaScript code to do that, that kind of tinkering. Uh, you, can, you can customize many elements of the, uh, of the component with straight up bindings and then put uh, values into properties in the component and bind to those. So you know, it allows you to do a, a lot of things very, in a very flexible way and get more reuse. You know, another cool thing about this login component is that none of the actual authentication logic or you know, for communication with the server to do authentication is implemented in the component itself. Uh, we have uh, event handlers that we define in a component. And in this case, we have an event handler for sign up or login event. So we can take this, this login component and we can use it in a higher level component that makes up our, you know, our main component of our application. We can say when we get this login event, then we're going to do the authentication logic. So we can keep the actual application specific logic at a higher level. And again, that, that increases code reuse because I can take the same login component and I can drop it into any application that requires this kind of login form. And I just attach different behaviors to the event handlers and you know, I've got my login. So, you know, there are all kinds of opportunities for reuse. Now, briefly, I want to talk a little bit about bindings. Um, we have the, the vote tabulation. So when, you're, when, you're, when users are voting in the application, um, you know, effectively what happens on the server is we're taking, creating like a vote record for each vote. And that vote record has a place ID associated with it. So what I'm showing you here is just the JSON data returned by the server when you retrieve the vote records. This is what it looks like. You can see that there's a uh, place ID in each one. So we want to take that data and use it to show the vote count next to each place. So we're actually doing that with bindings rather than JavaScript. And this is, this is where it gets kind of interesting. So you can look at this FRB binding expression. What we do is we group those objects by the place property. And that gives us the vote results. Then to find out which one was the winner, we take the, the entries in that, that group. So the group is effectively like a hash table where the, the ID is the place and the value is an array of vote records. So we take the entries from that hash table we find we use the this max function to find the uh, the one with the value that has the greatest length because the the array containing the vote records the the, the one with the most vote records will have the the greatest length. So here we're using these FRB expressions to to compute the scores. And when we want to present it in the user interface, uh, we can reach into that that hash table using this get property. And then we use the place ID from the individual block, and then we get the length of the array that's associated with it, and that's our count. So instead of having to do, you know, take, take the data from the server and do a bunch of slicing and dicing on it, we can use uh, FRB's, you know, very rich collection manipulation features to do it all in data binding. So what makes this especially cool is that all of the, whenever the values change, all of the changes will propagate. So let's say that a, you have the application open and another user opens it on their phone and places a vote. We use WebSockets to get the new vote record and add it to the array with the votes. Well, as soon as you add that vote record to the array, it, the, these FRB expressions will all recompute and it'll automatically change which one is the winner and you know, what the score value is in each of those tiles based on the new data. And it works that way if you replace you know, the whole data structure you're bound to or if you just change values, reach in and change values inside of it. So you know, FRB gives you a lot of power here and really reduces the amount of JavaScript code that you have to write. The language is a little odd. I mean, it has its own syntax, as you can see, but it, it's, it's intuitive enough that once, once you start using it, it, you know, it, really, it really becomes a very practical, transparent way of moving data through your application. So you know, that's, that's Nominate. Uh, now that I've shown you Nominate, I, I want to show you another demo that, 
that kind of highlights you know, a more sophisticated angle, you know, what we can do visually with components. So this is a WordPress viewer, and you can see we've got, we've got these tiles, and each tile represents a blog post. What I'm doing here is I'm using the new JSON APIs in WordPress to retrieve posts from an actual WordPress blog, and then I'm displaying the featured image and the headline for each blog post. And this, you know, incredible 3D display here is what we call the flow component. And the flow component, it will take elements and display them in 3D space using CSS 3D transforms. And it, it gives you like this really nice touch-friendly, you know, great on a tablet interaction model for, uh, for, for manipulating, you know, the, this, this kind of view. And it does it all, you know, in, in a way that's, that's very neatly encapsulated. You can take a flow, add it to your application, just dump data into it, you know, and have it display in this, this fashion. So, I mean, there are a few things here, like I made it so you can click a tile and it'll flip around, and then you get the, the content of the blog post. So, I mean, this is pretty cool, right? So I wanna show you next what the underlying JSON representation looks like for that flow. Okay, so this is from the component declaration. These are the properties that we use to define the flow. What the flow is, it's basically a path with a 3D perspective, like a camera with a 3D perspective on it. And the path has what we call knots, which are like, they're like points in the path that the, that the items will flow through. So you define the, the position of these knots in 3D space and then the angles that they'll rotate the items at. And you can also adjust things like opacity and things like that. Now, I mean, obviously, this is a lot of data here. And you, you could write it by hand in your component declaration. Uh, but what if there was a richer way to visualize it, a, you know, a better way to see this information and manipulate it interactively? What would that look like? So this is a visualization, I don't know, it's a little hard to see, but it's a visualization of that path. Uh, you can see it's like, it's almost like editing a Bezier curve in, in, in a vector art program, if you've ever done that. Um, you have handles on it and you, you, you can see the position of the curve and you can see the, the camera and the angle that the camera is taking on the curve. So we, you know, we would really like to be able to manipulate all of this data with a more interactive visual style, you know, like what you see there. And we can. So one of the things that's really fantastic about the Montage.js component declaration is that it is just JSON data. So here's a big word for you, homo iconicity. And if any of you have ever learned Lisp or a Lisp-like language, you probably know what that means. The, the idea is that your code is data, data that you can programmatically manipulate. And that's a really exciting concept because when, when you have code, your, uh, your application logic in a format that you can programmatically manipulate, it opens the door to creating very rich tooling on top of it, being able to manipulate it programmatically in interesting ways, being able to produce, produce it through scripts and from other data sources. And that's, that's a huge part of what Montage.js is all about. So, you know, when it comes to application authoring, you know, a lot of us use our text editors, our command line tools, preprocessors, various things like that. We all use tools. But you know, unlike native application developers, we tend to not do visual drag and drop types of development. And you know, as the web becomes more of an application platform and less of a content delivery system, you know, the, the, the need for you know, parity with what native platforms have you know, for development is going to increase. We really need richer tools. But, you know, there's kind of the stigma against visual authoring in the web development community. And, you know, a large part of where that comes from is just that the first generation of visual authoring tools for the web were really bad. Um, you think about a lot of the early tools and they were, you know, they took this WYSIWYG approach that, I mean, they're basically like word processors. And building a web application with a word processor is pretty much the worst experience imaginable. And it produced, the, the, those applications produced terrible code, right? So, you know, this, this stigma emerged against visual authoring because the, that whole model was just, was just such a, a step backwards, a step in the wrong direction. So, you know, what we've tried to do, building on this, this, this concept of our code is data, what if we could create 
a visual authoring experience that exploits that and allows us to manipulate the data as data. It, it provides useful and relevant visualizations, allow us to, to control and interact with the, uh, the, the, the content of an application in a way that's, that's practical. And most importantly, we're not generating code. Um, so if you're, if you're taking that component declaration, it's just data, you can generate that and you can generate it well. But you know, unlike trying to generate a bunch of markup from a you know, WYSIWYG you know, word processing type authoring experience. So what I want to show you now you know, is Montage Studio, which is kind of our vision of what you can do with, with interactive visual authoring when you take advantage of these characteristics of, of you know, code as data. So what you see here on the, uh, the left-hand column, which I'm scrolling here, is a visual representation of the component declaration. All of the uh, properties, all of the bindings, the prototype, it's all in there, but it's a visual representation. When you want to adjust the bindings or add a binding, you can just click to add a binding. You can drag in properties, and it has completion so that you understand what the properties are. See, when you select a component, like, so what we're looking at here is essentially that WordPress demo I showed you. When you select our WordPress controller component, which is a component we made in the application itself uh, for retrieving the data from WordPress, we have property field on the far, far right, you can see that text box there, that allows us to, to set the host property of that component. So we can take and expose the properties of our components in a, you know, a really intuitive, discoverable way. Instead of having to look at the reference documentation, you just click a component and you can see it. And on the, the, the black column on the very far right, you can see a set of components that we've loaded into our project. So you can actually drag a component from the palette into the, uh, the component declaration field area on the left. And I mean, it's just like writing that component declaration. All it's producing is the JSON, but it's giving us this really nice visualization. Uh, in the center column, we also have uh, basically a representation of the HTML DOM. And when you attach a component to an element in the DOM, it's just as easy as dragging and dropping. So, I mean, what we've done here is take, you know, the underlying representation as data, and we've, we, we've created a visual interface for, for manipulating it. And, you know, what's exciting about this, I mean, this is, this is the tool we're very excited about, but what's really exciting about this is that when you have this kind of application development model, you can build your own tools. You can build anything on top of it for manipulating the code and producing the application the way that you want to. Um, so, you know, you can take this a step further, too. I've shown you here how you have, you know, property, property fields, all the properties are exposed in this property editor. And we're using some, you know, like met type metadata. So if your property is an integer, you get a number spinner or whatever. But you could take that a step further and actually create a custom editor for a specific kind of component. So here's our flow component, which I've selected in the component declaration field. I'm going to open the flow editor. So now we're manipulating that JSON with a Bezier curve. And you can actually manipulate it just visually. And it's, what it's producing is that JSON like I showed you earlier. OK, so let's see. I'm not sure if the connectivity is good enough. I'd like to try to show you what that looks like when you do a live preview. We'll see. OK, that's good. So here's you know, a live preview of that application that we've loaded from from the uh, authoring environment. And now I'm going to open up that flow editor again. OK, and watch what happens. We're actually seeing the application change as we're editing it in a live preview. This is a fully functional working version of the application that we're, we're just editing in real time. And you know, I'm doing this on the same computer, but you can actually do this across devices. It works over the web. We're using WebSockets to propagate the changes. So if you were to open this preview on an iPad, for example, and you were to edit it on your computer in the editor, you would see the changes propagated over to the other device. So, I mean, this is, this is all taking advantage of the same characteristics of the, uh, you know, the, the underlying code as data approach of our component architecture. 
Um, so you know, I think that this, this kind of reflects a, you know, a, a potential approach to simplifying application development and reducing the, the amount of time and, you know, and, and complexity through you know, this component-oriented model. So real quick to wrap up, I want to show you, that, you know, where these components are coming from. In our Montage.js project, we have a package.json file. And in the package.json file, you can load modules from NPM that contain components. So we use NPM on the front end here. And what you're seeing here are the dependencies of the application, Digit, which is our, our widget collection, and then Montage WordPress, which is our, you know, that component that loads in the, uh, the, you know, the WordPress data. And it's just a component that we're loading from NPM and adding to the project. And when you do that, it shows up in the palette. OK, so uh, you know, that, that wraps it up. I hope that's, you know, that, that you can kind of appreciate you know, the significance of, of what we created here. Um, we have a beta of the tool online. So you can visit this address or visit montagestudio.com and sign up for the beta. You'll get in right away. And uh, you can build stuff with it. The framework itself is also available online. The, uh, Montage JS is open source, and it's on GitHub. So if you want to use the framework standalone without our tool, you can do that too. And you can build your own tools on top. We would love to see people build new stuff with it. Uh, so we're going to be here all week. I'm here with uh, two of my colleagues. We're wearing Montage Studio t-shirts. So if you happen to build something great with Montage Studio this week, um, you can track one of us down. We'll give you a t-shirt to show us what you've done. Uh, thank you. I guess I don't know if I have time for questions, but...